So it's been a year since Boruto 2 Blue Vortex officially released and I'm pretty impressed with the state of the manga. I think it's had maybe one or two weaker chapters but for the most part it's been a really strong manga ever since the time skip happened. With the release of the latest chapter which is 13 at the time of recording this, the manga just had one of the best chapters I think in the entire Naruto franchise and with it leveled up the entire manga as well, showing us that not only is Kishimoto in his prime, he can still write like he used to. Today I want to go over Boruto's good and bad parts because it's just something that has to be talked about. Just like talking about how Boruto's journey is similar to the journey you'd experience with today's sponsor. If you love these intense battles, epic storylines, and the journey from underdog to unstoppable force that we see in these series, then you're going to want to check out Over Mortal. It's an engaging text-based RPG where you can transform from a mere mortal into an immortal. Playing the game is just like playing through your own comic origin story. To celebrate its anniversary, Overmortal is hosting an exciting crossover event with the beloved fantasy series Tales of the Demons and Gods. From August 22nd to August 28th, 2024, you can join Nai Li and Ye Yun on an exclusive adventure as they navigate the Overmortal universe. During this special event, you'll unlock collab themed skins and explore new areas like Glory City, face unique challenges, and earn rewards like the Chrono Book and Nightmare Earn. You can also unlock the powerful new Divinity Master Buddy through value packs, plus daily login rewards and world bonus chats will provide additional benefits, ensuring a rich and immersive experience for all participants. Don't miss out on these exclusive rewards. Download Overmortal now with the link in the description or the QR code and use promo code DG010 to receive a treasure token, Fatum times 150, and Nimbus Jade Slip times 20. Jump into the adventure today. The first thing I want to talk about is just Boruto himself. It was obvious from the beginning of the series that this was going to be different than Naruto. How much different remained to be seen, but Boruto obviously could not just be a repeat. The story structures seem to be heading to, or at least leaning on, good guy Sasuke and a bad guy Naruto, those being Kawaki and Boruto respectively. But now we know, or at least it seems like, Kishimoto has fully committed to this idea. Boruto is not like Naruto in almost every way that matters, and I think his story is going to end the opposite of Naruto's as well. Where Naruto's story is a story that reminds you to be hopeful and that you can change fate, Boruto's story will be a sad reminder that that's not always the case. Of course, it won't be so simple, Kishimoto is much more creative than me, but that's just where I think the story is headed. In many ways though, I think Boruto being the opposite of Naruto sort of makes him the extreme of Sasuke. Where Sasuke lost his clan to his brother, Boruto lost his entire life to his brother and switched positions with him. There is the fact that Boruto also had everything from the jump from the beginning of his life, unlike Naruto, but just like Sasuke. And I think that makes it really cool that Boruto's adoptive brother is the one to completely turn his life around, because unlike Sasuke, whose real brother made everything go bad for him, that loss is what happened, with Boruto adding to his family is what eventually led to that loss. Now, that's enough narrative jibber jabber, I'm a power scaler. Rasengan Uzuhiko is just really cool. Putting aside the fact that Boruto one-shot code with this ability while it was nowhere near at full power, a Rasengan that uses the force of the planet added to Boruto's own Rasengan in order to do internal damage and non-stop internal damage until Boruto turns it off is just cool. Keep in mind, this is a jutsu, like I said, that's supposed to be doing internal damage. And when Boruto charged it up, not even to the max, he blew Hidari apart with it. Uzuhiko also ties into another really cool plot point that I'm going to bring up later when I start talking about Kashi and Koji and his new ability to see the future. But the end of it is, Boruto basically shouldn't even have this ability right now. This is technically Boruto reaching into the future and getting an ability from himself that he's going to learn way later on. Now, we don't know exactly how much in the future, but given the extremely high tier nature of the Jutsu, you could say this is 20, maybe even 30 years in the future. Since Boruto, unlike Naruto, is unknown to use the Shadow Clone technique in order to boost his training. And even if he could, Boruto has been shown to make like four clones at once. And given his relation to Sasuke and how much he fights like Sasuke now, I think it's highly unlikely that he was using the Shadow Clone training method. 
This is also Borto without his karma mark, and that's another really important thing in this manga. Borto cannot use his karma anymore. This reason has yet to be revealed, but I'm throwing it in the pile with things to look forward to because we have no idea why Borto can't access his karma, but Kashin Koji says he's going to lose control. This possibly means over the time skip, the connection between Borto and Momoshiki through the karma grew so strong to the point that even using karma will cause Momoshiki to take over Borto's body. And obviously that's an extremely bad thing with Borto being as powerful as he is. With the karma boost on top of that, Momoshiki could run through a lot of the verse at this point. This is somewhat ironic because Momoshiki is the reason that Kawaki wants to kill Boruto in the first place. It's the reason that Kawaki and Boruto ended up switching lives and now Boruto can't even use his karma power the same way Code can use his and Kawaki can use his karma power. So you could consider the karma mark something like Boruto's curse mark going back to Boruto and Sasuke somewhat being parallels to one another. Then speaking on Kawaki, I want to touch on what I believe to be his inevitable downfall. Now I'm not talking about in a power scaling sense, I don't really care if Kawaki's a fraud or not that strong, I'm talking about Kawaki's downfall both socially and mentally. Where Boruto is the extreme of Sasuke and opposite of Naruto, Kawaki is the extreme of Naruto. Both Naruto and Kawaki work their way up the social ladder. But Kawaki did it under false pretenses by switching the lives of him and Boruto. We've already seen people figure their way around omnipotence with people like Shikamaru, Amato, and Kashin Koji. Even if the Jutsu does suppress the doubts eventually, depending on the time frame, it might not matter. They could all band against Kawaki. And his downfall mentally might come before that from his lack of ability. He's put in a situation once again where he's pretty powerless. Code, Borto, Ada, Damon, and all the new Jubi people, everyone is stronger than Kawaki now, even with the sacrifice he made to get his karma back. And that was an extremely big deal for him. Kawaki hated his karma. He doesn't have Kashi and Koji on his side to help him like Borto did, where he can essentially train like he would in the future. All he has is to be able to lean on his karma even more and try to grasp at even a monochrome of power that these other people have. Now I want to talk about Kurama's return to the story. Baryamo was perceived as a different type of death, but that doesn't justify Kurama coming back not making sense. We're told that Biju will always come back. It just seemed as if Baryamo was going to be a different type of death where Kurama would never come back. That being said, this is something I do not like, and it's mainly just Kurama's tie to Himawari that makes me feel this way. Kurama coming back in general is something that I'm completely fine with. I love Kurama. He's one of my favorite Naruto characters to ever exist. The concept is fine, I just don't think that the execution is really there. Himawari especially not being really a character until 2 Blue Vortex, she's got a lot to do and prove in order for me to enjoy her time on screen. Himawari vs Jura was okay for the most part, but that was mainly because of Jura. Himawari doesn't do anything particularly cool in that fight, except bring out Jura's interest in fighting and make him want to go all out for the first time. So for the most part, I think this two to three chapter stretch is pretty much the weakest part of 2 Blue Vortex so far, and some of the weakest chapters I've seen from the Naruto franchise. Now I mentioned Jura, and Jura is part of this new Jubi villain group. Some people are calling them the Jutastic Four. They don't have a name yet, maybe they'll get a name in the future. But so far, they seem to be a little bit more interesting. The way these divine tree people are made is that one person gets grabbed by a claw grime, that person is turned into a tree, their chakra is sent to the Jubi, and it in turn makes a completely new person. So far, the people who have been taken in are Sasuke, Moegi, and Code's assistant Bug. These people all seem to be the opposite of what the other person was in their original life, where the person that the original host loved the most, the Jubi clone wants to devour the most, just like the God Tree always does. We don't know who Jura is a clone of yet, but there are some theories being thrown around that he just might be the main ten tails given a personality, and I think that's probably the more likely route that's going to be going on 
for the rest of the series. At the end of the latest chapter, we learn that we're about to see another one of these Jubi clones appear, and this is a chance for something extremely cool to happen. Now, it could be Shinki, it could be Orochimaru, it could be Gara, it could even be Kakashi. It would be Kakashi's first appearance in the Boruto manga as a whole. He did not show up at all in part one, and he hasn't shown up yet in Two Blue Vortex. The potential here is quite insane though. If Gara or Shinki is to be absorbed, that would be a nice way to bring the Sand Village into the fold of Boruto, where most of the other villages have been out of the story for the most part. It being Shinki is also increasingly likely, as we see a future vision from Kashi and Koji showing us that Shinki has indeed turned into a Jubi clone. A lot of people have thought this to be Naruto's clone, but I really disagree as Naruto is locked away in Ishiki's timeless dimension as Kawaki put him there, so I don't really see how Naruto could get a Jubi clone. Unless it was to grab onto some remnant of chakra, like Kawaki's prosthetic arm that Naruto powered way back during part 1 after Kawaki lost his arm in the Delta fight. But we don't even really know if the Jubi clones can latch onto that and then recreate a personality from it. It's just certainly a possibility and something that I think could be pretty cool. It could be Orochimaru, but it would be a little weird if it was Orochimaru because I don't know who Orochimaru would go for. Instincts tell me he would probably go for Jiraiya or Jiraiya's clone, that being Kashin Koji, and that would be a nice way to bring Kashin Koji into the fold and maybe see him fight again. But I really don't know if Jiraiya is who Orochimaru loves the most. They were best friends, but they didn't exactly end on the best terms. So I don't know how likely it is for Orochimaru to still care for Jiraiya that much. Another person he could possibly go for is Mitsuki, as he does show to care somewhat about his children. But again, it's Orochimaru, so we really have no idea who he could target. I would personally enjoy it more if he was to go for Mitsuki, just to give all of the children someone to go after. Mitsuki is also in the middle of a giant identity crisis right now, and saving his father might be what helps him discover himself. Kakashi is kind of the least interesting one here. I don't really know who he could go for at all. The only other person I could think of would be Mike Guy, but Mike Guy is in a wheelchair, and I don't really know if I want to see 8th Gate Mike Guy wheelchair form. It doesn't really sound too interesting. Another person is potentially Mirai, but Mirai and Kakashi only really interact in that novel and the manga that's somewhat questionable of his canon, so I don't know how likely that is to happen. Now on to the big thing, chapter 13, Kashi and Koji skyrocket into relevancy after awakening the Shinjutsu known as Prescience. This is the ability to see all possible futures. The way Kashi and Koji describes it, their future isn't simply one straight path. Different narratives get snuffed out based on which branch of each multi-fork crossroad is taken. It's a battle royale between destinies. He describes that one future they've already escaped is one where Ishiki kills Naruto and then resurrected into Kawaki's body. He plants a divine tree and then the earth perishes. And even though that didn't happen, he says that there was a big likelihood of it. And another example is the day that Naruto disappeared, whenever Kawaki and Boruto had that confrontation, if Kawaki had managed to kill Boruto and kill Sarada as well, then he would have lost tremendously to Code and then been devoured by Ten Tails in which the planet would be destroyed. But a future that has not happened yet, the very worst possible future, is one where Boruto ends up being killed by Jura. It's not an absolute thing, but as Kashin Koji says, a whole lot of futures show it happening. And then what follows from that is fairly similar. Kawaki gets devoured and the planet dies. Kashin Koji expresses how this future must be avoided at all costs, and on some level it might have already begun to change. At the end of last chapter, Jura pierced Boruto's heart with one of his eye lasers. And at the beginning of this chapter, he's about to finish Boruto off when he's called to do something else. He calls Boruto a truly lucky man and says it's as if the heavens themselves are decreeing that he remains alive. Perhaps it is some divine intervention. He's not too far off as Kashin Koji's new divine ability has helped Boruto stay alive as long as he has and accomplish the things that he has. As Kashin Koji says, the biggest advantage of his prescience jutsu is the ability to gather intel. 
He claims to know how to get Sasuke out of his tree and he's going to help Boruto prevent this worst possible future from happening and he's already helped him greatly with his intel by helping him gain the flying Raijin and the Rasengan Uzuhiko. One thing I do think this manga is fumbling on though is Sarada's Mangekyo Sharingan abilities as we have absolutely no idea what they could do or when they're ever going to come out again. I do think that's more of a fumble though rather than an actual knock on the manga. The most exciting part of the manga going forward is going to be seeing these new Jubi clones that are going to be appearing and how they make other people come into the Borto story. Naruto Shippuden did a good job letting us know that this conflict is not only about the Leaf Village. The Leaf Village is not the only shinobi village in the world and Boruto for the most part has excluded the other shinobi villages and I'd like to see them come back into the fold. If the Jubis happen to get a hold of people from other villages, that's literally the perfect way to do that, but we'll have to see what happens. 